we are in Psalm 34, verse 8, and it says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Father, for this opportunity to once again learn of your word and your scripture. And this evening, we invite your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would enlighten us with heavenly understanding as well as power to live out the word in our lives. Through Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, Psalm 34 is a psalm based on an event which we read about both in the book of Psalms as well as in the book of Kings. It is when David um, was running away from King Saul and he found himself needing help from the Philistines. So the Bible says he tried to get help from King Akish of the Philistines as a place where he could be housed. But when he got there, the generals of King Akish, as well as other advisors of King Akish, they perceived David as a threat. And so they influenced the king that why would you allow this man to be in your kingdom? This man is currently leading a rebellion against his own king in Israel, King Saul. What makes you think he can be trustworthy? So a seed of doubt was sown in the heart of King Akish. And when David realized that Akish may not house him, that Akish might even kill him, David had to pretend as if he was a madman. He had to get himself dirty, get soil on himself. And the Bible says he even drooled with saliva uh, on his beard. And when King Akish saw him, King Akish said, why would anyone bring a madman to me? David is a madman. This is the man that threatens the kingdom of uh, Saul. I do not understand why Saul is threatened by a madman. For that matter, King Akish says, there are enough mad people here in Gath. Gath was one of the provinces uh, of or the city-states of the Philistine empire. So he says, there are enough mad people in Gath. Why should I bring another madman into, into Gath? We have our own mad people. Take this man away. And so in response to how God saved him, by uh, uh, supposedly because of what David is doing, we are able to know that God is the one who then had told him that pretend to be a madman. Because in Psalms chapter 38, 30, uh, uh, 34, David attributes his survival to God as if God taught him this strategy, all right? Though in the Bible, in the story itself, it doesn't say God taught him this. But what we do know is that in Psalm 34, it is the Psalm of David. And when you read the heading, it will tell you, it says that a Psalm of David when he pretended madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed, okay? Abimelech uh, is a very common Canaanite name for the kings, but specifically this king was Akish. He was Akish, uh, 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 the king of Gath, okay? So David now writes this psalm, probably one of the best psalms uh, that we have, in celebration of how God delivered him through the pretense of madness. Now, here's a challenge I want you to do. When we are done this evening, I want you to go to YouTube. Listen very carefully. I want you to go to YouTube. I want you to search for a song called Psalm 34 by the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Just go to YouTube and type there Psalm 24, Brooklyn, uh, sorry, Psalm 34, the one we are reading. Psalm 34, Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. It's one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard, and it is based on this chapter, okay? It is a song based on this uh, particular chapter sung by the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Now, 
So this is the song of David. This is a song of thanksgiving to God because God delivered him in a manner that was not expected. God delivered him through madness. And of course, if I had time, I would preach on that story for you. Um, but it's a story that I just preached on a few weeks ago in, in, in my ministry page. Um, yeah, so some of you who do follow the ministry page on Facebook, you will either have heard it uh, when I was preaching it live a few weeks back, or you would have watched it later on because it is in the archives of the ministry page. So, uh, but I won't go into the story of madness itself. What I like is the verse 8. All taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Now, a few things I want to mention about this that will lead us to our prayer point. The first thing, David in this song, in verse 8, he says, all taste and see. All, okay? Now, in the Hebrew, there are a few words that will tell you something very important. In the Hebrew, the word all or behold, they are usually used when the writer or the speaker is about to say something that can only be attributed to God. So in the Bible, when somebody says, behold, or when someone says, oh, they are saying to you, I am now going to say something that is related to God. In other words, pay attention, because what I'm about to say is about God himself. It is not normal what I am about to say. What I'm about to say exalts God. What I am about to say reveals God. So that is what they use as, as an exclamation um, of attention. Okay? For example, in, in, in my uh, language, I, I am Zulu, so my home language is Isi Zulu. If I were to use the same, in my language, I would say Maye or Maye Babo. It is how I would exclaim in a way that tells the listener that I am about to say something that you really, really need to pay attention to. And that is what David does. He starts with this exclamation that says, oh, in other words, he's saying to those of you listening to my song, to those of you reading the words of my song, Pay attention because I am about to say something very important. He says, all oh, taste and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Okay? Now, as a matter of interest, he puts two sensories there that usually don't go together. Remember, um, we, we have five physical senses and we have a sixth sense which is now accepted as as a sense that is there although it is not a uh, physically traceable we have the sense of touch the sense of smell the sense of taste the sense of sight and the sense of hearing okay now up until recently a uh, scientists not all of them but many scientists have accepted that there is something called the sixth sense and what is the sixth sense it, it is basically described as that feeling or conviction that tells you something is happening though you are not able to prove how you know yet you know all right and women will almost say amen to this because women have mastered the sixth sense probably more than the men the amen no one can explain no one can explain the sixth sense but it's 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 an ability to know something is not right you know or something is right but you yourself cannot explain if we are asked to give evidence how did you know you 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 end up just saying look i just knew it i just knew it so there is a movement in the world of science to to accept that could it be that human beings have this ability um, in them to sense things without necessarily holding any tangible evidence, but they know that something is happening. So that is the dispute uh, around the issue of the sixth sense. That is where the sixth sense thing uh, comes from, okay? And of course, it's also, although this is not a sermon about senses, but it's just interest, interesting information to share with one another. Um, 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 some scientists have picked it up, for example, on twins. Okay, 
twins, that, that idea that twins have been studied repeatedly and they have been seen to be connected to each other even when they are far away from each other you know people will tell stories of how uh, one twin before they passed away the other twin fell sick for example you know those connections they they fall under this sixth sense category okay how you just know your your husband is cheating you've not seen a phone you've not seen a picture but there is just something in you of course sometimes the sixth sense is horribly wrong and and it leads to to a number of problems which is why other scientists will then say no nope, this thing doesn't exist but when we talk about senses they tend to go as partners okay what do i mean by that generally generally the sense of taste goes with the sense of smell okay we usually associate smell and taste okay we smell something and we conclude it will taste bad they, there's a relationship also there's a relationship between hearing and eyesight generally when we hear something what do we do we turn the head around so that the eye may locate where the sound is coming from when we hear we don't open that mouth to taste our our hearing is not a relative to taste like when you hear a sound you don't stick out your tongue and expect to taste something no when you hear you turn so that you can see so they they work together taste taste and smell and and eyesight and 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 hearing they go together now when we read this psalm something different happens David does not partner them as we usually know them. He says, oh, taste and see, taste and see. He doesn't say taste and smell, or he doesn't say see and, and hear. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good, okay? And, and of course, what he is combining here, just follow me very uh, uh, carefully, is something that usually is done by chefs. Chefs are the ones who usually force a relationship between taste and sight. Chefs will tell you that you eat food with your eyes before you eat it with your mouth. Hence, when you go through those culinary schools, how you prepare a plate is as important as the taste of the plate. So the, the, the one who is going to eat in your restaurant or in your dinner table must be seduced first by the eyes before they can eat. So let's assume David was following the chefs. Still, it wouldn't make sense because for the chef, when the plate looks good, it excites the tongue. Here we are told to eat before we see. We are not told to see before we eat. That's very important because it hits the whole thing that the Bible is teaching about faith. That faith is believing, tasting God when you know nothing about him before you even get to see. Ah, so in the word of God, experience comes before evidence. Faith comes before you can see. What is faith? The evidence of things unseen. The substance of things hoped for. In other words, we eat God even before we see he is there. Why do we pray? It is what we are doing. When we are praying, we are feasting on God. Yet we have seen no evidence he is around. What was Job saying to us when he says in, 90, in Job 19.25, I know my Redeemer lives. He hasn't seen the Redeemer stand at the soil. Yet he says, and at the end, my Redeemer will stand on the soil. In fact, he confesses. He says, even when this body has been destroyed by death, yet will I see him. Now, what is he doing? He is proclaiming that I know that I can taste God in my life, even though I have not yet seen him. My conviction and faith in God goes ahead of my eyesight. I don't need to see him in order to believe him. But it's the other way around. When I believe him, he will reveal himself. 
When I believe in him, I will see him. You've got to understand that that is the mathematics of heaven. When you believe, you will see. When Abraham left his home country and he went to Canaan land, he had never seen Canaan land. So what was he doing? He had trusted God. He had faith in God over what he had not seen. But because of his faith in God, he saw Canaan land. Do you understand what I'm talking about? In the Bible, it is not what you see that produces faith, but rather faith produces what we see. Faith makes things happen. And without faith, this is why Hebrews would then say, now without faith, it is impossible to please him. What is the Bible talking about? The Bible is saying to you and me, unless you have faith in God, he will not bring to reality the things you expect to see. First, you must trust him in their absence. When you trust him in the absence of evidence, he will make sure he does not disappoint our faith in him. He will make real what was not seen. Why? Because we trusted him in its absence. If I could give you a, a simple example, you know, the one thing that I regret about growing older is that I lost faith and I made it complicated. And I think it's similar to everyone here. And I'll tell you why. If any of us remember when we were little kids, do you remember how easy it was for your father or your mother to throw you in the air and you would laugh? You wouldn't scream and, and, and feel like you are dying. You would laugh. Why would you laugh? Because whenever they would throw you in the air, you would read their face, the joy, and that would tell you they won't let me fall. You see, when our parents threw us up in the air, we had never seen them throw anyone else in the air. We didn't know whether they have capacity to catch. We didn't know how strong their arms are. But we trusted what we saw in their faces. The love we saw in their faces told us this person will never disappoint me. The problem with growing up is we lost the beauty of that faith, which we now need more than ever in God. To know that if God throws me in the air, look into his eyes, he will not let me fall, he will catch me. Most of us have lost that beauty, that raw, simplistic faith that God will not let me fall. He will catch me. You know, I remember when I was a, a, a child at home uh, uh, in the rural areas, you know, you, you have to dig, uh, what is this thing called in English? Hey, okay, it's called foundations, but, but, but like a foundation for a house. Um, in my language, we call it Isiza. So, especially when you live in a mountainous region, to build a foundation for a house, you first have to dig against the wall of the mountain and then there's your foundation. So usually where I grew up, there would be big walls behind houses because we lived in a mountainous region and all the foundations were against the mountain. And I remember when I was a, a child that my oldest brother, he liked this that I should go and climb up there. And from there I should jump and he will catch me. And let me tell you the joy of it is that every time I went up there and I would jump, he wouldn't fail. He would always catch me. Up to a point where I was now the one is initiating. When I am bored, I would say to him, let's go behind the house so that I jump and you catch me. That is what faith is. Faith is knowing that the God who loves us will never fail us. And David says, can I just talk to all of you out there who don't know him like I do? I want to tell you that you need to taste him first. Before you see, taste him. 
and you will realize that those who taste the mineral because taste taste is about experience taste is about a, a, a walking the journey taste is about actually going through an experience with god because to taste something you need to eat it it needs to enter your mouth you must eat it and this is what david is saying david is saying i trusted him when he asked me to pretend to be a madman, I trusted him. I didn't know what would be the outcome of acting like a madman. I trusted him because he said I must do it. And what did I see? I saw my deliverance. Do you see the relationship? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. Now, the challenge that David is giving to us, when he says taste, what will we taste? When he says taste and see, what are we going to taste when we eat God? What is the taste going to be like? So let me give you this um, illustration. I, I grew up in a, in, a, in a fairly, fairly, very, very poor family. And so one of the things that we, we did not have on our plate were salads. The idea of a salad is something that I came across um, either when I was visiting the home of a friend who were a bit financially better than us or those special events in church, you know, then you get to see salads because every, all of us, the church was in a poor community. So salads are not something you would see thrown around every Sabbath. Only when maybe there was a 13th Sabbath, some big occasion, a baptism or Holy Communion, then for lunch you would see salads and all of that stuff. So, one of the things that I've always related to this story is the issue of salads. Um, so when I got in, introduced to salads, and then I got to discover, oh, there are so many different salads in the world, uh, some coming from Italy, from Greece, from uh, Portugal, from Spain, you name it. And then I discovered that all the salads that come from the Mediterranean regions, so whether it is an Italian salad or a Greek salad or a Portuguese salad or even a Moroccan salad, all of them have this thing in common called olives. Okay? And the first time I ate an olive, I didn't like it. The taste was just horrible. And I thought to myself, who puts this thing in, in, in their food? Okay, but then I kept eating salad, uh, uh, olives, and of course, as I grew up, started working, your economic situation changes, you eat all of these things that you couldn't afford, and here's something I got to realize. The more I ate olives, the more I didn't like salads that did not have an olive. So if I go to a function and they, there's a salad that they are serving for starters and there are no olives, I'd really get upset. And I'd notice that everyone else in the table would be upset. Or when you are given two olives and, and a, a huge bowl of lettuce and, and, and you know, carrots and peppers, but just two olives, you get upset. But the funny thing is, the first time you ate the olive, no one would have predicted that one day you would hate a salad without an olive. What happened? The olive developed an acquired taste in you. And before long, you discovered that though the olive is actually not sweet, it is actually one of the best tasting things in the planet. That is why you don't like salads that don't have it. And that is what... David is saying, when David says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. David is not saying God is sweet. Listen very well. God is not sweet, but God is good. He's not a sweet guy, but he's a good God. And what that means is that God is very difficult to swallow. He is like an olive. You need to acquire a taste with God. God is not swallowed once and suddenly you lack the taste. God is difficult to swallow. God is difficult to swallow. Right now, we are going through COVID-19. God could have stopped it. He didn't. That's God being an olive. He's not sweet, but he's good. When we lose our loved ones, God had every power in the world to not only heal them, but keep them alive forever. 
but he chooses to allow us to rest in death. That's not sweet. Not at all. God will allow us to lose our jobs. He could have stopped the business from retrenching us, but he allows it to happen. Let me tell you, dear friends, God is not sweet, but God is good. And there's a difference between those two things. That is why David said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, I've always warned Christians, like Seventh-day Adventists, you know how we like saying in our churches, God is good, and then we say all the time? I've always said to people, be careful of that statement. Because when, you, when, when someone says God is good, and you say all the time, remember, when you say all the time, you are signing a contract there that says no matter what happens in my life, I will never doubt the goodness of God. And the minute you say all the time, you then are saying, let life throw what it wants to throw my way. I know I have a good God by my side. And so I've always said to people, if you doubt that God is good all the time, when they say God is good, be honest. Say sometimes. Don't say all the time. Because when you say all the time, you better mean all the time. Not some, all the time. And all the time includes now. See, right now, when our relatives are dying, when we are losing jobs, when businesses are collapsing, this is one of those of the all the time. Remember all those years before COVID-19? Remember how many times in church they said God is good and you said all the time before 2020? Do you remember all of them? All the God is good all the time. Well, now is the time to remember that you meant even such a time as this. Even now, God is good. I did not say he is sweet. I said he is good. To say God is good does not mean he is easy to understand. But it means come what may, I know that he is not irresponsible about my life. Perhaps let me go back to the olive. See, when you eat olives, olives don't taste good here in the mouth. Olives don't have a, a sweet taste, okay? But an olive is good for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? An olive is not sweet, but an olive is good for you. Those who do diet, nutrition, they'll tell you. The olive comes with very good healthy oils, but one of the strongest oils that the, uh, or rather the strongest parts that the olive helps in. Those who have done research, they say the olive produces one of the key ingredients for the body to make folic acid. Folic acid is an acid used by the body to strengthen the muscles of the heart. So when you eat a lot of olives, the result is a stronger heart muscle. But you see, while you are eating the olive, the olive doesn't announce to you what it will do inside. When you are eating the olive, the taste doesn't tell you just how important the olive is. And that is how God is to us. I want to suggest this this evening. Many of us currently may be struggling to swallow God because we see things falling apart and we are questioning where he is. Well, let me tell you, God may not be sweet in the mouth, but somewhere behind the scenes, he keeps the heart going. Where you and I cannot see, he is sustaining this world. That is why Job says, when I go to the north, I do not find you. When I go to the far south, I do not find you. East or west, I do not find you. Yet you know the way I take. Because while we may not locate God in our troubles, he can locate us in trouble. And that is what matters more. There is no reason for me to locate God as long as he can locate me.
because it is not me that will rescue God. It is God that will rescue me. So even if I cannot see God in the midst of my troubles, yet he knows the way I take. Which means in the midst of my difficulty, God, my great olive, is working behind the scenes, doing things that I could not imagine. And David says, taste and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I want to assure you, dear friends, this evening, that the God we worship is not an irresponsible God. And I can assure you he is not sweet. That much we now all know. We all know. If you haven't discovered it yet, you are going to. As I've grown older, one of the songs that I have come to realize, I'm not so sure the ones who wrote it know what it means. There was a chorus we used to sing as children uh, that would say, pretty Jesus. And, and uh, as I've grown, I've thought to myself, that man is not pretty. That man is very difficult. He is not easy to understand, but he is by far the best and only God. And those who trust him, he will never fail them. So the next time you are eating a salad and there are some olives, and as you eat your olive and you get this strange taste, always remember, when that olive enters the stomach, it strengthens the heart. And so is God. God may not be easy to understand. God may not be easy to swallow. He is a difficult God to understand. We are sinners. His way of thinking and acting is far beyond our comprehension. Why he will allow diseases and wars and all these things. And why at the same time he would go to the cross and die. He confuses us. He doesn't make sense to us. But one thing we do know for sure. He is a good God. He is a good God. When I reflect in my own personal life. I think of times when I was so angry with God in the midst of a particular decision where I felt God failed me dismally. I can remember, and I'm sure those of you who have walked quite a bit of a journey with God can recall what I am talking about in your own personal life, where you were so angry with God, you wished you could find a way to just hold him by his neck and, and, and just give it to him. But you know, as the years have passed by, I've looked back at some of the decisions he made, which I highly questioned him for. And in time, some have made sense. Some of them still don't. But the ones that now make sense to me have encouraged me to trust him with the many other decisions that he has made in my life for which I have not received the fulfillment yet. See, when God fulfills what he was doing in your life, you suddenly look back at that decision you were questioning him for and you laugh at your own stupidity when you think, ah, oh, now it makes sense. This is what you were leading me to. This is why you allowed this and this and that. We were coming here. But at the time, no one could have made that link. And I want to assure you, and I know, I know for a fact because it happens in my life even now as I speak to you. I know that there are many among us here right now who are struggling with God because he has become an olive, a very unpleasant taste in our mouths. But I also want to encourage you, you are not alone. And I also want to tell you that you are not the first to not understand him. There are many who have gone ahead of you who understood him eventually. It takes time. And when God finally fulfills his plan, then and only then do you ever understand why he did what he did. You see, I don't know why he has allowed COVID-19 to come into this world. The same way I do not know why he allowed Africa to be colonized. It is one of my most painful questions 
And as much as I'm a Christian and, you know, we all have our point of struggle, I must confess, I'm still not okay with why God allowed all these nations to brutalize us. The French, the English, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Chinese, they all come to this continent and they do as they please. I, I don't get it. I hope one day in heaven, God will make me understand what had we done to be the continent that always gets abused? What had we done? Why do people leave their continents to brutalize us when we have never traveled to theirs to brutalize them? I don't get it. See, that's one of my olive moments which God has not answered yet. But I've got many others which he has answered. And those are my point of encouragement. They help me understand that God has a plan in all things. Some, Hallelujah. when they got a family, they didn't understand. You know, when you're a faithful husband, you love your wife wholeheartedly, and she cheats. And on top of that, she gives you HIV. That's something so hard to understand. I did everything right, God. I did everything the right way. Why am I now dealing with an incurable disease? So COVID-19 is not the only one of the diseases that has plagued this world. There are so many things. There is poverty. Some of us, we did everything right. We went to school, we studied, we worked hard, and yet we watched the wicked prosper around us. David, by the way, also struggled with this. In one of the Psalms, he questions God. He says, why do the wicked prosper? Why? The righteous are here and they are struggling. Why are the wicked prospering? You see, dear friends, that is what I'm talking about. God is not easy. I'm not going to lie to you and say God is sweet. No, God is not sweet. God is not a chocolate cake. God is not some vanilla chocolate or whatever you eat. God is good. Sweet he is not, but good he is. And this evening, I want to pray with those of us who are saying, Lord, I'm struggling. I have questions. You are tasting bitter to me right now. I don't know if I want to swallow you because I have questions that you've not answered. And I'm saying to you, he is an olive, swallow him. For now, he is bitter to taste. But wait till you see what he is doing for you behind the scenes. I can guarantee each and every one of us here, God is at work. God is at work. You see, in 1988, in the month of February, my mother and father died same month 1988 i was an infant at that time today i am married i am a father to three boys i have way more than what they had when they were dying i am even older right now than my father was when he died now, when I reflect on the poverty and the pain I grew up under, listen to me very well. God did not kill my parents. God did not make us suffer. But when I reflect, when I look at my brothers and the life we live, I am now able to say, you know what, God? When you made that decision to allow them to die, it wasn't a sweet one. It plunged my family into poverty. However, standing here today as a pastor, I now recognize that out of that poverty, 
He shaped me and my brothers for a life of testimony and ministry that no one could have understood then. Amen. That's what Amen. I'm talking about. Hmm. That's what I'm talking about this evening. He is not an easy God. But he will bring you to a moment one day where when you look back at the decisions he made in your life, mm -hmm. you will realize they were not sweet decisions, but they have put you in a place where no one could have ever imagined you would be. We grew. Amen. We went to universities. We graduated raised by our grandmother our father's mother alone mm -hmm. she had no husband she had no formal education she could barely write her own name mm -hmm. but she managed to give us the greatest gift of all mm -hmm. she gave us jesus that Probably. is the one thing she never compromised jesus mm -hmm. at home we ate Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the afternoon, Jesus in the evening. Her answer to everything was God will provide. So many right now are struggling with this God. So I'm going to tell you again. Maybe there are those pastors who preach to you simply because they were called and they went to college and they studied. I'm not a pastor by degree. I wasn't produced by a college. I was produced by the circumstances that God allowed to happen in our family. And those circumstances gave me and my brothers a testimony that no one can argue us away from. My faith is not a product of reading. It is an experience of walking with God when everyone has counted you out, when everyone believes you will amount to nothing, then God says, now watch and see. Watch and see what I can produce out of you. My dear friends, to all of you listening to me, God is not sweet, but hear me and trust me from my testimony. He has a plan. He has a plan. And if you just stick with him, greater are the things he will achieve through you than you could have ever thought or imagined. I won't fool you and tell you that it's going to be easy. Whatever journey he has allowed you to go through, you are going to have some tough days. Some days you will regret. Some days you will curse him. Some day you will wish there was another option. And some days you will even try other options. But please, whatever happens in this life, return to him. He knows what he is doing. He's a good God. He Hallelujah. is a good God, and he will see us through. So, I know when he allowed COVID-19 to happen, he had a plan. I didn't say he caused COVID-19. No, no. I said aloud. He knew the consequences. He knew you. He knew me. He knew who would not make it out of this catastrophe and who would. Maybe I am one of those who won't make it. I do not know. But what I do know for a fact is I've lived with him long enough to know whatever decision he makes about me, it is the best that could have ever been made. Mm -hmm. That much I no longer doubt him on. Every decision he makes, difficult as it might be to understand, I can assure you, it comes from the most immortal, only wise God. No one could have made an, a, any better or wiser decision than him. This evening as you go to bed, I guarantee you, you are safe. You may not be having a sweet life right now, but you are safe. 
he is not irresponsible. He knows why he has allowed you to go through what you are going through. And believe me when I tell you, it will all come together in its right season. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I want to pray with you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you first for the gift of life. Father, I thank you that in the midst of the difficulties that the world has currently, we are still breathing. It cannot be said whether we will still be breathing in two months from now, or a year, or ten years from now. Nevertheless, our hope and our strength is in you. Our everything is in you. You are not just the only God that exists, but you are also kind and merciful and loving and wise. This evening, Heavenly Father, I admit, you are not easy to understand. Your ways are difficult to grasp. But one thing we have come to know in our walk with you, that you never do anything that will bring us harm. In everything you decide about us, your plan in the end, in its fulfillment, is that we shall all spend our eternity with you. Father, this evening I want to pray. I want to pray in a special way for those of us who have entered a season of difficulty where you have made decisions in our lives that we just don't understand. Because you see, Father, I know, I know it was in you to stop any calamity this world has gone through, whether it be HIV or poverty or wars or COVID-19 or oppressions or colonization or any kind of danger that the world has gone through. We know that you always had the power to stop it. And yet you allowed these things to happen. And Father, we do not have all the answers. We also know, Heavenly Father, that even at a personal level, we have lost our loved ones, you were there. We have lost our jobs, you were there. Some of us are wrestling with diseases as I speak, cancer, diabetes, blood pressure, and many other things. And when these things came into our bodies, there too you were there. And Father, this evening, I want to pray that all I ask you to do, give us faith to trust you in the unknown. Give us faith to hold on and believe in you because your word and our past testimony tells us that you always have a plan and the plan is never to harm us. In the name of Jesus, we claim the promise of your word in Jeremiah 29 verse 11 when you confirm that you know the plans you have for us and that the plans are not to bring us harm but that the plans will bring us a future and a hope. And Father, therefore, I pray right now, so many of your children around the world are giving up. They are losing faith in you. They do not understand where are you at this moment. But you see, Father, these are questions that some of us have asked you before and you came through. This is why in the midst of the madness we can preach this message boldly. We know you do come through. You've been coming through. You've always come through. Even though now we cannot explain when you will come through, we know you will. Uh. And Father, what we know, like Job, we can confirm, even if this time you will come through long after I am in the ground, yet one day I will see you. We will all see you. One day, the bones will have flesh again. And with our own eyes, we will see you when we have made our way out of the grave. And so, Father, I pray, do not allow us to lose faith in you. Now more than ever, the world needs to know you are there. 
Now more than ever, your children are looking for a sign, something to tell them that you are there. Lord, I pray, give us a sign. Give us a sign, dear Lord, that you are there. At this dark hour in the history of the world, at the midnight of our lives, when dark is there, when the morning seems too far to come, now more than ever, dear Lord, we need a sign. We need the prison doors to be shaken and the prison to be opened. We need a sign that you are there. Father, I want to pray in the name of Jesus for those of your children who are listening to me right now, who are at the edge, who are giving up, who are struggling. Give us a sign that you are there. Mm. Father, I want to pray in a special way for those of your children who feel like they are facing death itself. Some have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Some have been diagnosed with cancer or diabetes, a, a, a type A, or many other life-threatening illnesses. Father, would you visit us and confirm that you are still there? Mm -hmm. Confirm, dear Father, that we are not alone. And Father, in this time of difficulty, I pray that those of us who have an experience with you showing up just when all things seemed like they are lost. Teach us not to keep quiet. Teach us to tell the world that hope is on its way. And that we know from our experiences that you are always there and that you never fail. Father, give us the gift of faith. This evening I pray for those whose faith is struggling. Pour out your faith on us that we may know that we are not alone, that we may taste and see and know that you are a good God. And mm -hmm. let all who believe say amen.